we realized on the calendar, the acronym for the podcast is W-I-T-I. W-Y-T-I. Yeah, it's Whitey. I'm thinking witty. Well, witty. But the Y, it makes it Y. Whitey. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know Welcome what? Welcome to the Whitey podcast. I would be worried about that. Yeah. Except for the fact that we are the only two white guys that shoot the shit on the internet. Like yeah. If, if no, that were like a, a common novel trope, concept. I'd be worried. But as it is, like, <laughs> the world needs this. Right. They, they need to hear our perspective. Have you seen the Whitey podcast? It's like, oh, it could only be... Andrew yeah. and that other guy. Yeah. <laughs> Who's that guy that when he talks, we feel like our credit rating goes up because he's that white. He's like a storm of mayonnaise. Who's that dude? Yeah, that guy and his friend that looks like he's from the Big Lebowski. Those two guys, <laughs> they're, they're the ones, yeah. Uh, I was kind of hoping that you didn't have the beard going on. I had shaved. I know you did shave. I saw you, uh, I don't know, like a week or two ago, mm -hmm. something like that. You look so much younger. I know, yeah. But also kind of emaciated, right? Yeah. Like I, looked, I looked like weirdly skinny <laughs> without the beard. I mean, you look good with the beard. But I wanted you to not have a beard, so I look better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's this weird trade-off where I look 10 years older with a beard in, yeah. in ways that have been very awkward since, like, I was 16. Mm -hmm. But I think I look more handsome. So I look oh, yeah. older but more handsome. Yeah, and yeah. So I can pick, do I want to be clean-shaven and look 39 my actual age, mm -hmm. or do I want to be mistaken as the uncle of my dates, which happens <laughs> regularly? <laughs> But also look better. Yeah. And I'm so far Optagon uncle. <laughs> uh, oh, uncle works for you. Yeah. Yeah, well, in, in the job that you're in, I, I would listen to this man. Plus, N like... No beard heat and is like, who the hell deep, are you? Deep down, I have a beard. I'm aware yeah. of that. Like, like the like internal, if my, emotional beard. My Obi, like when I die, my Obi-Wan Kenobi will have a beard. <laughs> that, is, that is the thing that <laughs> yeah. comes out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so in this episode of Would You Touch It, Andrew. Wallace, no. Uh-uh. Oh, he's getting squeaky? Yep, Wallace. We just remember that anesthesia medication that you definitely were drugged with up until 40 seconds ago. Mm -hmm. Brianna will literally camp out next to him for the entire podcast. Nice. That's your job. You're not the dog handler. Mm -hmm. Wallace is heading over. So, Andrew. Yeah. If you could tap this button and immediately reveal the existence or non-existence of God, mm. would you touch it? Gosh, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, hey, Wallace. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, sit, buddy. Well, sit. He's got to sniff around first. Okay. He's got to make sure that's a secure location. Mm -hmm. Got to mm -hmm. check the corners. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would hit it or not. I'm going to get kind of condescending for a second. Sure, sure. Okay, so this is like for the entire planet mm -hmm. immediately, all at once, every religion, every worldview. Uh, that has ideas of spirituality and God and his mm -hmm. role and your role in the universe, all of these things, immediately you are revealing whether or not God exists at the push of the button. Are you touching it? I don't know. Mm. I'm usually like, here, here's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. Um, I don't currently think God does, but I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. That'd be kind of sad if yeah, it turned so out I was right. Classic if it, agnostic. If it cl if it clarified it and it's like, no, nah, it really is just chemicals and infinity. Enjoy mm -hmm. your brief time before nothing. Yep. I'd be like, that's kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, I would add to that that like, um, Kurt Vonnegut has a line in one of his books where he was uh, he was in the trenches with a, a Catholic guy, and the guy was so disillusioned that when he came back, he became an atheist. And Vonnegut, who is an atheist, says. I didn't wish that for him. I mm. thought that was such an incredible loss for him. He, yeah. It had been such a big part of him that I wouldn't really wish that on anybody. That's yeah. kind of how I feel where the there's a part of me that's like, yes, truth and everything. And then there's a part of me that's like, well, the problems I have with religion aren't the religion. The problems right. I have with religion are the application of religion. It's yeah, the... the the myopic ideology that casts an entire other group of people right. as like sinners and evildoers that must be cast aside exactly. or, and, or and put down. And inquisitions and, yeah. and crusades. But those are also things that happened with the Soviet Union and with mm -hmm. Maoists in Cambodia. Like yeah. it's, it's those actions and mindsets that bother me, not the actual religion itself. But I see lots of beauty and, and utility in the religions. I yeah. think they're a great sense of meaning and, and So community. let's start with like personally and then we'll talk about like culturally and you know just globally so personally is that something that you would want to know or not know if the button was just for you to begin with we don't have to talk about the ramifications ripple effects yet Here, here's what would I you push the button what and then here's you know what i want to do here's yeah, what i want to yeah, do yeah, yeah. if if you have already seen it mm. and you know the answer mm. i'm like we would have this conversation and then i would immediately get 
like a roofie or something to black out. Yeah. And and then the deal would be if there is a god, you'd hit the button. And if yeah. there's not, you would we would forget this conversation. Mm. I don't I don't I don't think I want to have that door permanently closed, even if it's true. Mm. I don't think it's gonna affect my behavior a lot, but it is gonna affect my sense of hope. Oh yeah. So See, that, then I, that's yeah, that's just it. I mean, so I I think personally I would like to keep that question mark if it turns out it's a resounding no. Mm. Um, but I, so, I worry for everybody else, though. I wonder so what they would do. So you're not, to clarify, you're not pushing the button. I don't think button. I'm Are you going to push the button? I will push the button. Okay. All yeah. right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, is this because you have such faith that you know that this will clarify, or are you worried at all in case no? Uh, I do have faith that there is a God. Okay. There is um, a, a creator of all things. Mm -hmm. And I had a very, very Christian upbringing, non-denominational. Um, and the the longer I go and the more, you know, I am exposed to other worldviews and beliefs and religions and stuff, you, know, you, you get to that point where you think of all of the different places where I could have been born and all the different religions that I could have been born into, the fact that the idea that I landed in just the right place at just the right time to get just the right thing that's only the right way and only the right path and... It's just our little pocket of the universe, and everybody else doesn't know what they're talking about. But us right here, born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh -huh. and yep. staying around in the South and you know in America, and we really got it figured out. And then whenever you have that context, and then you look at, well, once you actually read the books, and you look at you know, uh, yeah, um, Judaism and, uh, <laughs> and basically the big three, Christianity, Ju Judaism, Islam, and what they have in common, and kind of the roots of the whole thing. And then you look at what modern United States of America Christianity is, and then you compare that to, well, what is in the Bible? It's like, we aren't really doing that. Yeah, and the thing that we're very adamant about being just, this is what God intended, is like, well, this is just a very small window of time, and it's not really tracking with what was in, in these scriptures. So my current belief system is, yes, there is a God, and I do believe that the role of Christ was a savior sent by our creator to basically give us a lifeline to, you know, an experience after life. Hmm. All of the other things beyond that are very negotiable in my head. Hmm. Because even, you know, the older um, iterations of, Christ of Christianity, like before we even colonized, uh, you know, what is now the States, looks wildly different, very different. If you even like the music, the way that they worship today. If you go to a modern church, especially non-denominational um, the South, a lot of the music sounds like, it's like the soundtrack to Frozen. <laughs> yeah. Let it go. Let yeah, it go. Yeah. It's that energy. But then you go you know, across an ocean, and it's a totally well, different my, approach. My theological backgrounds Eastern Orthodox. Like yeah. That's where all of my bearings come yeah, from. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it's Byzantine chanting. It sounds yes. very, very old. It sounds kind of Arabic. There's some, yes. I think, documentation that actually the Arabs kind of borrowed Byzantine mm -hmm. um, musical structures and things like that. So yeah. for anybody to basically be born into a thing and take a snapshot of that iteration of their religion in that moment of time and thinking like, oh, they got it figured out. This is perfect. Everybody else is wrong in the center and they should be like, ah. Well, there's all, like, and I, I say this yeah. as a very devout former Christian. So yeah. I'm saying this with some insider credentials. I'm not saying this. Yeah. I'm now I'm an outsider, but I used to be in the club. Yeah, we both uh, are, grew up in Oklahoma. We both grew up in Oklahoma. Yeah. And for the record, if I get struck by lightning and it turns out there's, there's a god, I'm going to go line up with the Greeks. <laughs> like I'm going to like be like, which, which way are the the Arabs at? Yeah. Okay, I'm with the Lebanese for some reason, and right. I'll like I'll line up with them. So yeah, yeah. Um, also, by the way, would be thrilled for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of atheist friends where like if they woke up in heaven, they'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> Fuck! I was wrong. Yeah. Ah! Like, like, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not rooting for a turn right, of right, blackness. Right, right. Um, that said, though, something that even now gives me pause mm. is, I've read the New Testament, and Jesus mostly talks about giving away your stuff to the poor. Yeah, I would say that's probably eighty percent of what Jesus talks about. Yeah, and me with my economist brain, mm -hmm. I know that anyone in America would be considered ludicrously wealthy yeah. by the standards of first obscenely, century Jerusalem. Like, take rich. the richest person in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. didn't have a refrigerator, didn't have a car, didn't have a, a smartphone capable of giving you every band on earth simultaneously, yeah. let alone porn, having... People bring you food at the push of a button. Food from all over the planet yeah. that is 
completely fine. Yeah, you and had a magical chariot you can take at a high speed. Yeah, anywhere. like it. We we would a window into anything at any time ever. Yeah, yeah. and like and then like, the only difference is that they had people they could yell at if you were rich, <laughs> but like I yell at Alexa, yeah. and also like uh, somebody did the calculations on this. Um, the amount of servants you would need to do all the stuff your physical devices do, and mm. like the average American yeah, has yeah. the equivalent of 80, 80 to two hundred eighteenth century slaves, yeah. you know, something like that, right? And so I look at that and I'm like, I'm definitely not giving away all my stuff, right. uh, and and I'm pretty sure I would fall short of that Jesus commandment. And so right. I do get I do get a little worked up with some of my Christian friends that are getting really hung up on to me yeah. ephemeral issues where I'm like, you need to give your shit away. That's yeah. your your guy told you that. Right. Well, the whole the, the fixation on God's guns and gays is like, wait, which book was this in? This is not really they, what the priority is. They mentioned the gay thing a couple times, but again, yeah. they mentioned the giving your money about, away exactly. like 50 times. Talking about the oh, way more. Proportionally, I think if we were yeah. going to focus our time and energy and attention into the things that were proportionally in the book, you know, time, energy, and attention. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. It would be wildly different. I think it would be unrecognizable yeah. um, than what most uh, modern Western Christians act out as their religion. Um, you know, that said, I'm thinking about that just for me, again, starting from that personal place. If we're going to talk about the ripple effects, though, at, immediately at the drop of a hat, whether or not there's a God, let's hypothetically say that we push a button and it's revealed, no, mm -hmm. there's not. It's chemicals and pheromones and just cosmic luck mm -hmm. that we're here for a while and then we're probably going to end up killing ourselves <laughs> within the next couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. how, how, I don't know, devastating and just um, hopeless, maybe like a third of the planet that really is banking on, yeah, it's kind of rough now, but I'm going to live this kind of life and I'm going to get these kind of brownie points and I'm going to make it to that special paradise just immediately. That's gone. Yeah. And especially, oh my gosh, think if you're at the end of your life and you lived a life strictly adhering to this, you know, these guidelines and this belief system, and then you realize, oh, I wasted my life. Or, or is kind of driving what you're talking about, driving to what you're talking about. Was it not necessarily the point that there was a God? Maybe it's more to the point that here's a system of behavior and principles and core values that can lead you to living that could lead you to living a fulfilling and content and, and happy life. Because I was actually having a conversation with um, Brianna recently about this. Who? Brianna. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Banana. She made us the cocktails. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that lady. <laughs> uh, my co-host on the Whiskey Tribe. And we're saying, I, I think the biggest difference I see between my parents' generation and the generation after me is it seems to me that the parent, my parents' generation, they had a more myopic and narrow worldview of what was acceptable. But also they had the benefit of what is acceptable, that, that narrowing of focus and that mm -hmm. narrowing of, of you know, behavior. And they have more purpose and drive and ambition. And this, you grew up in this country and this is, how, this is what you do. And this is what you don't do. Now, with the younger generation, I see so much purposelessness. And I think... It, it may be because we have so much unbridled, unrestricted freedom to go anywhere and do anything and behave however you want. Uh, and with freedom, I think the thing nobody ever talks about is, well, it's like overchoice at a restaurant. Yeah. He's like, well, what do I do? You can do anything. Yeah, but what? But whenever you said, well, no, no, this is what you do, and you get outside of that, then you're a bad person. It's like, okay, fair enough, I'll just go do that. I think that's part of why, um, right when you leave college, like, yeah. unless you're going to law school or, or med school or something, it's kind of terrifying. Yeah. Because you've been on this track. You've been on a railroad yeah. track for 18 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know exactly how well you're doing because you can look at your grades and you can compare yourself because everybody's at the exact same age cohort as you. And then the train stops, and they're like, everybody get the fuck off. Right. And you're like, where do I go? And they're like, any Not my one problem. Of 360 degrees. Just pick a direction and walk. And you're like, but I don't, I don't know what to do. And they're like, yeah, yeah. We, we don't care. We just got your money. Leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, in our country, we celebrate freedom. But at the same time, there is benefit to having a narrowing of this is what you could and should do with your life. And whenever that's completely left open to interpretation, then you have these little um, pockets and clicks of belief systems and behavior. And well, this is the right way. No, this is the right way. So with that 
complete unrestricted flexibility comes with with it i think a lot of stress mm. and a lack of clarity and a lack of purpose just because people don't know what to do so many people need that step-by-step -step linear progression of this is what a good life looks like and yeah. now who's to say what that is well, there, there's so me being the friendly low wattage agnostic character I see lots of benefits to religion anthropologically. Mm. Like so, to back up a little bit, I think it's interesting that neither of us thought there would be moral pandemonium mm. if if the big there is no God flashes in the sky. Neither yeah. of us went to the purge right. immediately happens, which I don't think it would. Like when I was religious, I thought that if you didn't believe in God, you could not be moral. And then I quit believing in God, and it turns out I don't want Honestly, to kill anybody. Man, turns some of out the, some of the most ethical and moral people I have ever met do not believe that there's God. I think that's independent from whether or not you believe that yeah. there's. And yeah, I, and I like from from my end, like I'm I donate money to charity. I help people. I'm I'm there are people way 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 nicer than me. But like from my perspective, I'm doing it for free. I don't know yeah. that there's any benefit to it other than it just seems like a nice thing to do. So I, I'm with you there on on the anthropological side. That if if we're just looking at this anthropologically. Um, I don't see it so much as you need to have that stricture as just having an operating system. Mm -hmm. um, so like my, my undergraduate degree, I have one in history and I have one in religious studies. Mm. Um, so I've studied this quite a lot. Yeah. And I, I, would, I would define a religion as a, um, a schema that gives order and ethics to the world. Okay. Um, that would so people in my experience when people talk about what a religion is they basically just describe whatever their religion is yeah. so they go like in, here in America we go um, uh, it has a holy book and a god and stuff like that and then yeah. you can find pretty quick that while most religions have some of that none of them have all of it like yeah. Buddhism doesn't have a god it can it doesn't have to it's really kind of incidental yeah uh, and then there there are faith traditions that don't have a holy book right so I would define it at its at its root as a schema not scheme but schema right that that gives a, a lattice and structure work and, and meaning to life yeah and has an ethical dimension to it yeah and, it would... and one of the benefits of that is that if you plug into a religion you don't have to constantly figure out what the meaning of life is it's right. already been given to you yeah whereas if you don't have it you got to like really sit down and think about yeah, that yeah, all yeah. the time and you got to think about the ethics of it whereas if you've got a religion it's creating a heuristic shortcut that actually limits the amount of mental labor you need to do so you can focus on other things so, so with that frame you know what is religion i, I do you see religion as a construct created by man like this is what you do to interface with interface with a creator with god um there's a saying i always forget who says it but basically religion is man's attempt to spell the name of god with all the wrong blocks hmm. so if we're just talking about the you know the cornerstones and framework and scaffolding of religion i don't see that coming from a creator of an infinite universe and life it's like okay this is man's best attempt to give some guidelines and some steps and some structure to how to interface with this unfathomably large uh, and powerful creator that, you know, within the tenets of Christianity has our best interest at heart. But most people, they aren't really, I don't want to say capable, but just in terms of like trying to live a life, it's very, very difficult to have the bandwidth to try and figure out, okay, I'm going to eat, I'm have shelter, take care of my family, figure out how to connect with the creator of the entire universe. See, like that, that's that's one of the things I liked about Eastern Orthodoxy. Eastern Orthodoxy has a really profound mystical side to it. It's very much like right brain Christianity. Like yeah. I, I think I think Catholicism is by nature very scholastic. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, it comes out of the this Aquinan model. It had the uh, it had this kind of Platonic stuff that came in from from uh, its Greco-Roman past and then uh, it has a, a, a Augustine and then Aquinas and it's this very scholastic, very logical way of approaching the world. And I think Protestantism, to a great extent, is a new answer to Catholic questions, but the bearings are the same. Yeah. Eastern Orthodoxy is much more right brain, But even then, having that mystical element to it, um, in, in Greek theology, the term dogma has a different meaning than in the West. In, okay. in the West, dogma means like this thing we all have to believe, yeah. and it has kind of a pejorative tent to it. Um, dogma, in a, in a Greek sense of the word, is um, kind of the shaft of light you're stepping into, like you're you're directly experiencing the oh, divine. Oh, so it's a positive thing. Yeah, it's it, it, it it's a completely different word. Mm. I, I don't know why it why dogma means what it means in the West, but they're completely different. They just yeah. they sound the same, but they're different. But dogma is your direct experience of the divine, and kerygma is your attempt to express it to other people who have not seen it. Mm. So like iconography, hymns, the Bible, all of that yeah. is an attempt of somebody that can see talking to somebody who can't see. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. going like, it's kind of, okay, you know how music, blah, blah, like trying to explain mm -hmm. to somebody that cannot have that same frame of reference. I never had a spiritual moment when mm -hmm. I was in, I mean, I never had anything that I would describe as like a divine moment. So I could yeah. only plug into the kerygma. I could only like, mm. um, uh, you know, kind of participate in the, uh, the interfacing of others. Uh, and so, um, 
Uh, is that why you drifted away from your upbringing? Is like, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not really having the experience as described. For me, I, com- I, com- I had a lot of doubts, and I was pretty good at compartmentalizing them for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then I started looking at them as a sum total and went, oh, there's a lot of doubts when yeah, I look yeah, at yeah. that as a basket. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it was just personal life. I had a... Uh, um, chronic pain for several years Mm. and felt very abandoned by the Almighty. So there could be just some, uh, just, just emotional rancor. Yeah. Um, but there were also, so like in Eastern Orthodoxy, um, the theology is uh, largely built around this concept of theosis. So I think, and I'm being very reductive and I'm not accepting any hate mail at this time. I understand (laughs) that everybody, I understand, I used to be religious. I understand how important it is to be religious. You literally cannot reduce a religion without being profane. You can't take anything holy and reduce it and give a synopsis without pissing off the people in it. So are you trying to not offend people on the internet? Because that's a losing battle. What I'm telling them is I am not going to be reading any of the stuff you send (laughs) me about why I am incorrect (laughs) about Anabaptists or whatever. I'm not. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to be a dick, but I'm also not going to be accepting any any. Right. Do not send me your manifesto. Um, pray for me. Do not send me your manifesto. Right, right, right. Um, so, um, like in in a, in a Western Christian model, uh, uh, mankind uh, sins against God, and they are uh, the, the result is hell. Mm-hmm. And uh, Christ comes and gives them the option of leaving hell, and we can now go to heaven. Like I know I'm being very reductive, but yeah. it's deliverance from hell. Yeah. In, in Eastern Orthodoxy, because um, that right there, like that's the limit of my Judeo-Christian belief system. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, there's uh, and, and even hell. You could be convinced me that there's not a hell. There's things in the Bible. It's like mm-hmm. may kind of put that on the fence. But um, there was a Creator of all things, and then He put us in charge of this dominion of this world. He gave us the keys. And I think one of the biggest questions that people have. Um, with whether or not there's a God is, well, there couldn't possibly be God who loves us. Otherwise, these horrible things wouldn't happen. Um, and I have another very simplistic, glib interpretation, which I'm sure is wrong. I'm going to piss off a lot of people. But if you are looking at it within the frame of authority, if we have been given control and dominion over this existence, over this world, this is ours. Like, good and bad, there's evil in the world. It's like, well, we, mm. we let that into the world. This is our house. We're in charge. And that whole that song, you know, growing up, he's got the whole world in his hands. No, it's our mm-hmm. world, and it's in our hands. And sometimes we do a pretty bad job of taking care of things. Mm. So the fact that there's bad stuff going on, I don't put that on God. I put that on, okay, made in your image means we have the ability to say no mm. and defy whatever, you know, um, relationship that he wants us to have with each other and with him and to the extent that we have bad things happen in the world i don't think this world is what god intended at all that's fascinating and i want to come back to that because yeah. i think the problem of evil is a really really big one yeah yeah uh, I, I do want to bookend the the alternate eastern orthodox kind of worldview so uh man sins cursed with hell christ redeems him from hell i think that's a very like reductive way of looking mm-hmm. at western christianity yeah. the eastern version is god's or man sins the, the result is death Christ saves us from death, mm-hmm. uh, and this, there's this underlying motif of the, the point of mankind was to become more and more like God, and Christ is now, by taking the divine and becoming man, he has actually brought humanity into the Godhead. We yeah. are now, we've now ascended into the Godhead, and, and the point of our life now is um, while we will never be the same substance as God, we can continually kind of polish ourselves and better and better reflect Him. So we're becoming more and more like God through a relationship with God. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful theology, which I find very poetic, but yeah. when I put my logic hat on and mm-hmm. I go, and I know this is a very big if, yeah, yeah, yeah. but if I were God, yeah, yeah. it seems odd to me that the most important thing in the world, the whole point of your being, yeah. is the one thing I'm never going to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. And and, and I, I do talk to people. I yeah. talk to... Moses, I talked to Noah, there are people I talk to, but yeah. even though this is the most important thing in the world, I'm not going to talk to everybody. And that that just struck me as a very, very logical breakdown of if this is true, then it is not following suit. Yeah. Um, I, I When it comes to um, logic and reason and measurable things, I think that is a very legitimate struggle. But at the same time, I, I the more that people started rallying around this idea of science and believe scientists and believe the research and the things that you can measure the more comfortable I got with truth, like actual profound truth, isn't necessarily logical. It goes beyond logic. And uh, people that says, you've got to believe the science, you've got to trust the science. Like, Well, which which window of time with science? Science now, science 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because it's constantly changing. 
And if you think we're ever going to get so good at measuring things that we will get to a point where we can understand fully and completely everything in the known universe, that's not the promise of science. That's not what science is intended to do. Um, a really good analogy I heard somebody explaining the role of science is it, somebody that only believes what science is willing to reveal to them. They're like a pilot of an airplane that never looks up from their instrument panel. If it's not on the instrument panel, it doesn't exist. It's so like this window and this reality and the birds and the trees and the mountains and the clouds and the sky and the stars, like, well, that's not here. So that's not real. That's a lie. Hmm. Because until it's here, then it doesn't exist. So my relationship with science is, yes, there is a place for logic. There is a place for measurable things. But I think there's a place for things that you simply can't measure and you'll never be able to measure because they are beyond our capacity um, as humans, as creatures, as, as living beings to even wrap our head around right now. So I leave room for yeah. things being be beyond me. I agree with you to a point, right? So I, actually, I've got my dog right here. Yeah. Um, I watched a dog cognition video years ago. And uh, uh, anybody that has a dog will relate to the fact dogs do not have a good sense of spatial relationships. So mm. they understand a leash means walk. Yeah. They understand that you're holding the leash. They do not understand that they are connected to the leash that you're holding. They can only remember one relationship at once in their head, which yeah. is why they wrap around trees and things. They, yeah, can't, yeah. they can't remember this, right? And I started thinking, if you could ask a dog, like, what is it like to have such a stunted view of reality? And yeah. they could talk. I think they'd be like, what are you talking about? Right. I see reality exactly yeah, as yeah, it is, yeah. which makes me wonder, okay, what do, there's got to be shit I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's like 18 dimensions or something that they prove mathematically. I yeah. can think of four. Yeah. I don't like, so there's got to be things going on that would mystify me. And I don't know, it may, it may not even be that they haven't been discovered yet. It might be that we're incapable of even fathoming them. Right. right? So I, I definitely have room for that. But I see that like inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning strike me as different. Like, I think you're alluding to inductive reasoning of the idea that um, there, there might be something beyond this proof that we can, we can find. Hmm. And I don't, I don't disagree with that. Deductive reasoning is I'm looking at what is said and I'm seeing inherent contradictions in it that yeah. disprove it. And yeah, so yeah. there are religions that I can look at. I don't want to invite any more hate mail, but <laughs> there are specific <laughs> religions I can look at where I'm like, I'm pretty sure I can disprove this. Yeah. And, and um, I would... If I, if I had the capacity to choose, mm -hmm. I think I would choose to be religious, but I can't do that. I can't mm -hmm. like, I can, I can hang out. I could go to the, I can go to coffee hour, which I yeah. genuinely miss. Yeah. But I can't, in the same what way. Is, what is coffee hour? Uh, coffee hour? Yeah. Like, uh, oh, like right after church, everybody goes and gets coffee. Oh, I never did that. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've um, yeah, I'm not going every week, but most weeks I find myself in a church uh, with my kids and, um, I've never really connected to the biggest reason why you even go to church is like the community aspect. I'm not a community guy. And we need to swap spirituality. Really? Like I'm, okay. I'm, I'm a Labrador retriever. I just okay. want to hang out with other people. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You want to go walk through the woods, which is what I end up doing because I'm hot and unwed. <laughs> so <laughs> we, should, we should do like a Freaky Friday thing. Right? Yeah, you Switch swap, roles swap bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the whole, you know, the purpose of church is your faith is made stronger together. And I do get that amplification effect. It's, you know, for all just the purposes... It's an echo chamber of which I find a lot of like internal allergic reaction to whenever there's just people reinforcing something. It's like, ah, I kind of want somebody to hold up a hand and go, but have you considered this? I want to stress test my ideas, my belief systems. For me, that reinforces it. Sure. You know, you know iron well, sharpens I, like, iron. I did that too, but yeah. eventually I stress test it too hard. Oh, and, and, it, and it broke. And it broke. And, yeah. and like, kind of my feeling, because I'll have, oh, why don't you just, like, like again, choose to believe it? And I'm yeah. like, that that to me is like saying, well, why don't you just choose to believe two plus two equals five? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. I can. I can lie about it, mm -hmm. or I can I can decide to like not talk about it and hang out, but I can't internally do that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, from where I'm at now, it's almost like I climbed a ladder and then like the ladder got kicked out, and mm -hmm. I'm like, that's that. I can't get back where I was. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think personally, we're talking about what's going to be impactful for us with the push of this button. Mm -hmm. What do you think would happen globally? I'm I'm really so. One of the things I'm curious about is, I'm assuming in this example that I believe the sky, this big thing in the sky. Mm. I'm not convinced everybody will. Mm. So I don't know that the push of the button would. Even, yeah. Okay. Are, are we? Are we like? So we push the button, and a lot of people go, "No, -uh. don't believe it. <laughs> don't, don't believe it." Right. Yeah. Uh, or, or I, I don't. Know, maybe, maybe we have the ability to put it in their head. What if it was irrefutable? 
is irrefutable. Okay, yeah. everybody believes it. Yep. it the, 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 they it, just know it, the reality. It has a, a proof is put in the sky that yep. is so overwhelmingly obvious to yep. everybody for the rest of all time. Okay. Um, I think that people would get sad. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people would get sad. Yeah, even people that, you know, they don't believe, but they kind of hope there's something. Again, that's where know. I'm at. You know, I'd yeah, be a little yeah. bummed out. Um, I think, I don't actually think it would change wars and stuff. I think mm. a lot of atheists believe that if... Only we could get rid of the religion and the dogma, but I, the, the, the yeah, Soviet Union, I the think, Cambodian uh, right. uh, genocide. I think to most me, wars these days are politically driven. Yeah, I think religious wars are kind of an idea that people just kind of project onto religions. But if yeah. you look at the mechanics of what going on, it's of what's going on. It's natural resources and it's politics. I, I it's not really. I think we have a deep, deep ability to demonize other tribes and to find excuses to do so. And religion is a very convenient one, but it doesn't yeah. have to be. And yeah, we yeah. found lots of other things to kill each other over. Um, I think there'd be some amount of people that would truly be hopeless. Yeah. Uh, I think the majority of people would come around to just the position of like, well, guess we should still be nice and chop wood. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. there's, um, did, did you see that video, um, uh, Too Many Cooks, that came out a few years ago? Have you seen that? Oh, and it just gets progressively yeah, yeah, yeah. more and more just like trippy and crap. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. It, it's hilarious. It's, yeah, it's a brilliant yeah, video. Yeah. Right? So, um, that the guy that wrote that or that made that the, the director that made that also wrote a short story collection called more stories of cancer and spaceships <laughs> and it's very very funny yeah. I, I, th I think this guy's brilliant i'd love to meet him sometime um the it's a very funny book but there's this underlying ethos of like deep deep sympathy to the indignity and difficulty of life yeah and uh one of the stories they have, i think is the kickoff story is it's a series of vignettes of just like um, dumb jokes like, you know, a, a, a priest, a rabbi, and a lawyer walk into a bar. Stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, but these two characters keep getting drug into these jokes mm -hmm. and, and are like, like, this is horrible. Like, why is this happening? The final joke is like they're, they're at the, the pearly gates. Yeah. And St. Peter comes out and goes, well, we only got one slot left, so we're going to figure out by who can pee the furthest. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the blonde does something kind of dumb. Right. And the, the lawyer does something kind of sleazy. And one of the guys just cries and walks <laughs> to the edge of heaven. And one of the other guys comes up and goes, "What? Like, wh what's going on? And he just goes, does the indignity never cease? Right. And then he just puts his arm around him and they stare into the void. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would do that and go, there may not be anything, but thank God you're here. Or th yeah. thankfully you're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would, if there was not a God, if that was the, the reality that was exposed with a push of a button, I would hope that a lot of the people that are utterly certain that they are righteous and correct had a moment and then it's like ah oh, maybe shouldn't be as much of a dick you know what really helps with that yeah. not being religious anymore not not because <laughs> yeah. it's not that i'm no longer religious that right, i'm right. a little bit less unyielding but i know for a fact i've been wrong about very big stuff in my life because hmm. i currently don't think there's a god yeah. and i used to absolutely think there was a god yeah. and when i thought there was a god i thought all atheists were secretly lying mm. like deep down i thought they all really knew there was a god right, they're they, just pissed they, off they, got they were pissed shoulder. off they had daddy issues and things yeah. and, like, and now i'm kind of the other way around i'm like well i know i'm wrong about this once right like i know at least once i was wrong about a very big thing so my current operating theory is I feel like I'm right about everything, mm -hmm. but I know that I'm wrong about about 25% of whatever I currently believe. I just don't know which bits. Yeah. So, like, I kind of need other people to call me out so that at some point I'm like, oh, that one thing I thought. Like, I, man, I was really convinced of that economic thing I talked a lot about. Maybe I was wrong about that. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I, I. Do you think it could, after the initial shock, be a positive change where it's like, okay, well, I guess we really shouldn't put off the best of what I could possibly experience because I think a lot of people is like, I'm going to like grip my tooth and do this thing. And here's the rules. And I can't do that. And I got to do that. And I got to chastise those people and rebuke that behavior. And do you think that once you know, like, well, okay, this world, this time on this planet, this is as good as it gets. So yeah. maybe we just collectively try and make as good of a go of it as we possibly can. And then like the place that we're going to leave to the next generation Maybe that's not a shithole. Maybe we should probably. Yeah, I think I think you'd see two things. So I can say in my personal experience, have you have you read much C.S. Lewis? Uh, yeah, some. I, yeah. I I read a lot of it during my Christian phase. Yeah, there's a, a, there's the um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah. Did he also do the Case for Christ? No, that's Lee Strobel. Yeah, I read that as well. Um, uh, I uh, he he wrote the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but he wrote a, a really excellent apologetics where he, yeah. He is, what was what was the mere, mere Christianity is okay. a really good primer. Right. Um, the problem of pain. Yeah. Uh, the great divorce. There's some really really good books. Um, so he describes in mere Christianity that that 
ethics are basically three phenomena. And what he describes it as is we're in a fleet of ships going in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. And one dimension of this is what direction are the ships going? So yeah. like, what do we want from society? One of the dimensions is what do we do to each other's ships? Do I bump into your ship? Do I shoot cannons at your ship? Right. Do I steal things from your ship? And then another dimension is um, do I actually own my ship or am I just entrusted with captaining it? Mm -hmm. And so if, if I am a captain of somebody else's ship, i.e. God, mm -hmm. then I, I am subject to the the orders that have been given to me. I found that when I le left Christianity, I kept the first two things. Mm -hmm. I still very much care about where society is going as a whole, and I, I very strongly feel about my interaction with other people, but I feel much more liberated about my ship. Mm. To where like that happened, and I was like... I'm going to have a lot more sex. Yeah. You know what? I did. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I got to sleep in. So I feel like I feel like that happened and what one of the things that I do think would be interesting to like completely turn tack is um I think that uh, in terms of how we understand poverty still has a deeply religious yeah. medieval hangover to well, it. This is something that we blew past earlier in the conversation. This is Wallace back here, by the yeah. way. Sorry about that, guys. No, no, no. Uh, earlier in the conversation, we are talking about, well, the way that early Christians lived and they're sharing stuff and giving away their possessions. I mean, it's kind of as close to pure small-scale communism is literally a commune. And you and sure. I, before we even hit the record... Although, although you you could leave if you wanted to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I mean, yeah. like There's not, a big difference with all the commies right. that I know. And I'm not a communist at yeah. all, because I think whenever it is a an ideology that is um, performed and executed by very flawed human beings, it does not work. Uh, but it was a commune. Mm -hmm. Like, definition, it was a commune of people that just shared everything and gave stuff yeah. away. No, it was, it was very sharing-based. Um, and you keep, like, every other interaction with you. Oh, no, I'm all for... You're giving me a progress I'm report. I'm all for communes. <laughs> you give me a com progress I, report I, on I, wa I want to live in a cult minus the death. <laughs> the sex stuff, the right. tax evasion, all of that sounds fun. Living with I, my buddies. I told the Heaton before we started shooting, I'm in for three months out of the uh -huh. year. I'm going to be part of the commune. Yeah. I got to get out of Texas like great. June, July, August. Uh -huh. I got to be gone. Then it'll else. be great. We'll pick a wonderful place. That I'm sure I'll probably pick like a super cold place, but it'll be great during Fine. the summer. It'll be like Beautiful. 75 degrees. Beautiful. I'm in. Um, I, I'm with you on all of that. I agree. Like like in, in reading the New Testament, like, you know, you're sharing and you're you're giving people whatever they need. Yeah. Um, that, that's not what I'm so much alluding to is I think that um, like now we can look at certain things and go, that is not a good... Even if I'm a devout Christian, I'm not going to apply the Bible to that. So for example... Uh, if you're an electrician mm -hmm. um, and you're a devout Christian, that governs how you interact with your clients and and things yep. like that. But you're not looking at Leviticus to understand protons, right? right? Oh, like please don't. Yeah. Yeah, and you and I think anybody would logically go, these are just separate things. Like it's like the, yeah, be very very cautious about how often you look at Leviticus because it gets very yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Le Le inconvenient very I say quickly. Because Leviticus is the funniest sounding name of the Bible, <laughs> yeah. and it's also like the most wonky, dense right. like jargon. Yeah, yeah. But but there there are things that we would go. Oh, I understand why you're doing that. That is, you can totally be religious. That is not a good application of your religion. This mm -hmm. is a separate field, right? Yeah. And the the more I get into political economy, the more I look at economy, I go, oh, we still understand uh, economics largely in a medieval construct where people are poor because of greed. Yeah. It is greed is a sin. Mm -hmm. Stop the greed. And um, while I'm not advocating for greed and whatever we want to call it, mm -hmm. like I, I I have this kind of uh, cognitive dissonance when I do a thought a thought experiment. So let's say we have two people. Yeah. One person is a he makes about thirty thousand dollars a year, and he gives half of his money away to charity. Yeah. He lives very very frugally, and he mm -hmm. gives half of his money away to charity, which I think. By by any Christian definition, would be very laudable. Yeah, there's actually uh, a story in the Bible whenever a woman gave away right. a very small token of, but proportionally to her entire right. income was yeah. huge, and she gave way more than a certain person. Absolutely, as opposed yeah. to the rich person that gives two percent, even yeah. if it's more. Right um, now, let's let's say on the other side of this, um, there's a person that doesn't give money to charity. Mm -hmm. They create a business. They make shoes. They employ 15 people. Um, shoes are made, uh, and they become pretty wealthy. And they don't give away any money. From where I'm looking, that person's actually alleviating more suffering than mm -hmm. the person that's giving half of his income away. Yeah. And so, like, if I were a bishop, yeah. I would say the guy giving away half his income is a better person. But as an economist just interested in macro suffering reduction, I would say the person that's creating wealth and value is doing a better job. Yeah. But I think that from a medieval mindset, that makes no sense. It's well, just it's, greed is bad. It's interesting. Um, in uh, Jewish communities, uh, the, the idea of charity, um, just giving somebody money— is actually seen as the lowest form of charity. Huh. And this is speaking as a non-Jew. But 
to your point, somebody that is creating economic, economic opportunity and jobs, um, teaching people to find success and take care of you know their, their situation financially to to provide for themselves. That is a much more admirable uh, form of supporting your your you know. We're just the concept of wealth creation for most. I don't know that I even blame this on religion so much as just the feudal period, but. Mm-hmm. For all of the middle middle ages, yeah. it was zero sum. It was how much there's there's all wealth is based on land, and right. it's just the whole system is just extracting blood from turnips by screwing peasants over. And there's a limited amount of land, and whoever has the land is wealthy, and that's it. And we don't generate anything. Nothing's built, nothing's made. It's mm-hmm. just stealing resources from each other. So at that point in history, if you could take stuff from people, you'd become more wealthy. And if you're wealthy, it's because you took stuff from people. Yeah. And thankfully, we're not doing that now. If, if you build a house, yeah. and you pay me to build, I'm the construction worker, you pay me, you get the money for the house, I got the wages, and somebody gets a house. The, the pie has been expanded. Yeah. And um, I think I think that we, we still have this hangover of just, you know, greed is the reason that people are unwealthy. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I was recently watching a video talking about uh, the Ten Commandments, and there's a pretty reasonable case to be made that the um, commandment of thou shalt not steal, the more accurate interpretation is uh, thou shalt not kidnap. Oh, interesting. Yeah, huh. yeah, huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I never do that. Uh, well, yeah. I, I rarely do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm like one or two years. Can, can I say real quick? Yeah. If there's Jews listening, yeah. <laughs> I would love to convert to Judaism. Like, yeah, you I, like, mentioned this before. I lived yeah. in New York. It was great. All my friends, well, not all, 80% yeah. of my friends were Jewish. So yep. we're going to accommodate. It was great. It was such a cool culture. They're, yep. they're, they're fun and witty and smart. And also, God is optional in mm-hmm. most of the Jewish sects. Like, yeah. I know if you're like Orthodox Jew, no. But like right. for all of my Jewish friends, like they're more atheist than I am. And <laughs> yet, they get to go to Rosh Hashanah and stuff. And yeah, they yeah, get yeah. to participate in... Uh, um, uh, uh, Yom Kippur, which sounds like a blast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and wait, is the, it's the one where they all dress up and, and yep. do the the kind of like um, uh, the play. Uh, anyway, point is, if you're a, a Jewish lady yeah. and you would like to, I, I, I'll convert. We'll raise our kids that way. Yeah. It sounds awesome. I get all the benefits yeah. of you want the, the community, community yeah. the coffee hour. Yeah. I think we probably sleep in. Uh, <laughs> probably. But but the God bit kind of optional. This sounds right. delightful to me. <laughs> you you are a Jew in the making. Uh, my my um, my parents uh, have a lot of their oldest friends are, are uh, Jewish, um, and it was interesting hearing about sitting shiva. So whenever like somebody has a parent die or something in in you know the South, it's like well like send them flowers or like a casserole, and um, you know my dad's best friend who's Jewish, his dad died. It's like well what do I do? He was asking another Jewish friend. I was like well you just you just go. It's like well I give him like a heads up. No, no, they're, they're, they're sitting Shiva, and, you know, when they're doing that, you just walk up, knock on the door, and you just hang out. Mm. You just be there. Mm. And that's going towards what you're saying about, like, the community side yeah. of things. We're just baked into yeah. how these big events in our, in, you know, our lives, how we're supposed to interact and support each other. So, yeah, it goes to, again, the religions and the constructs and that have happened over traditions and the way that we interface with people— I I'm very resistant to that kind of thing. Like when it comes to like people a hundred years ago came up with a system that you know what you would hate. Okay, wait. Can I can I yeah. back? There's there's a fun book if you if you like if you're interested in religion. This yeah. is a really fun book. It's called Creation by Gore Vidal. I read okay. it maybe six months ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, it actually made me feel much better about mortality. Yeah. Um, uh, I had previously read Julian by Gore Vidal, which is about the last pagan emperor of the Roman Empire, and that. Um, Great point made in that book that, like, um, all, all men kind of bristle at the idea that they're not going to exist after death. It seems like an injustice, but nobody's like, wait a minute, I didn't exist before I was born? Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah, yeah. I should exist forever, both directions. Like, <laughs> no one cares that I didn't exist prior. Like, yeah. it's all blackness going back four billion years. Yeah. Totally heatless. Mm-hmm. I never exist. Doesn't bother me in the slightest. But for some reason, the other direction really bothers right, right, me. And right. I was like, oh, yeah. And then I started reading uh, Creation by Gore Vidal. And um, the character is a Persian ambassador going around the world um, at a time when all the big religious thinkers um, are, are hanging out. Like, so uh, Socrates, Confucius, the Buddha, and one other that I'm leaving are all operating at the same time. It's really weird. Like, there's the, yeah. I, I, my theory is that that's when writing came around, so all the big religions um, start then. Mm-hmm. Um, but he... Um, uh, he, he he's hanging out with the Buddha, yeah. uh, and he's talking to what I think is a Jain. I don't know a lot about Jainism, but um, that guy goes, here's the deal. Um, he's explaining this to the main character. We all live 250,000 times. There's right. nothing you can do about it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. live 250,000 times. I have lived 
2,499.99 times. Yeah, yeah. This is my last time. Yeah. I'm going to leave. Yeah. And that's the goal. But there's nothing you can do. You can be a bad person. You can be a good person. And then he talks to the Buddha, and the Buddha's like, oh, no, no, no. He's, com- I guess, completely wrong. You are reborn again and again and again. And it's when you realize how long you've been here, it's torture. You mm. just you just want to get out. You just don't want to exist anymore. It's been so long. You just, you just want to cease to exist. And if you can get to nirvana, you can finally break the cycle. You won't be reincarnated. You'll just dissipate. Mm. You'll no longer be around. And I read that and was like, I'm kicking ass. Yeah. I, think that, I think that's what happens to me. Yeah. I like. I think I achieved the Buddhist dream according yeah. to that interpretation. Yeah, like yeah. right out the gate. I yep. think this is life number one and the only one. Right. You just crushed it. Yeah. Crushed immediately. It. According to those dictums, like if, if if I could go talk to those guys and I'm like, no, I'm done this time, they'd be mm. like, wow, congratulations, good job. <laughs> like, wow, overachiever. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to circle back to because we're we're getting you know close to the end because I pushed the button. I want to know, and I think after a rough window of time, people will acclimate to, you know, whether or not there's a God. Because if it was exposed that, hey, there's a God, I think a lot of people would just get, oh, shit, really? Hold on. Wait, what am I doing? That would be fascinating. <laughs> that, would just, that would actually, I think, it might even be more more right, weird at right, this right. point in our history for yeah, that A lot of people suit up like, real quick. Sweden's fine. <laughs> like, I hang out. Can I do it real quick? Like, yeah. like I, you know, I, I spent a, a summer in Scotland, mm. and uh, I was there years ago, um, very first time I was there, and I saw an Orange Man parade, which mm-hmm. is like a Protestant parade, which I didn't even know was a thing in yep. Scotland. And there's all these old dudes, you know, holding up Protestant banners and things. And I, like, grabbed one, and I was like, hey, I don't, I'm not saying this to be offensive, but... Everyone I've met in your country is an atheist. Like yeah. every single Scotsman That's I've true. met is an atheist. And you're anti-Catholic. Like yeah. what? Like why? And he goes, oh, they don't believe in the Catholic God. We don't believe in the Protestant God. And I was like, that fucking sums up everything right there. Yeah. Uh, but like they're doing fine, right? So yeah. But if it turns out like, no, there is a God. And like you start going, oh, maybe I should give more of my money away. Because right. like. I, I was thinking about this on the drive over. I don't know we were going to be talking about anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if if a bus hits me and there are pearly gates, I think that I think that the assessment that I would get at the pearly gates are. So your whole thing was you were witty and you just weren't mean to people, right? Did you do anything to help anyone? Yeah, yeah. not really. <laughs> so you just you didn't really contribute anything at all. You just weren't mean to people verbally. Yeah, that is your thing. And I'd be yeah. like, so can I slip in the back? <laughs> like what? And they're like, no, get the fuck out of here. You like you read the book? You right. read it by your own admission. I'm like, right. yeah. And they're like, and you what? What percentage of your income did I give away? And I'm like. After tax, two <laughs> percent. They're like, get the fuck out of here, you useless fuck. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that's I think maybe conveniently, but um, my version of why the nature of religion doesn't really seem relevant to me. Like God creating these constructs and these rules and these steps that you have to do to somehow make a infinite creator happy. Like, I don't see that as the role of God. And the role of Christ. I think it was like, hey, you kind of bungled this situation up, fellas. Uh, let me throw you a little lifeline. And whether or not you're good or bad, I mean, compared to a perfect and infinite creator of all things, I think even the best of us is a piece of shit. You know, okay, and this is where my inner humanist comes in. Yeah. Because like we, we are, I think, by and large, society, including the atheists, still has this deeply... Judeo-Christian sin model, mm-hmm. where like mankind is fundamentally bad. Yeah, well, there, I, I, there's that, but also I think being made in the image of Him, our capability of reaching beyond what you know, flesh and bone and primitive instincts. I think that's where we see the image of God. Hmm. Whenever we can reach beyond the things that is selfish and you know, um, you know, <laughs> and and uh, has like anger, and and you know they're horny, and they they just want like to do destructive things. I think man is uniquely capable of not only aspiring beyond that, but making choices and taking actions beyond things that are reasonable, beyond things that are logical. And I think that is when we see the essence of God reflected in mankind. And I I see it like if aliens came down, everybody, Mm. because whenever you watch sci-fi, the aliens are always snotty about like, hmm, your your planet still has currency? Our planet, blah, blah, blah. I think aliens would kind of be like, Oh, this is awesome. Like, you guys are apes, and you've developed wristwatches? Right. This is amazing. Yeah, like, yeah, have yeah. your deer done anything? No, the deer haven't done anything. Of course not. Why would deer fucking do anything? But you guys have built automobiles, <laughs> and, like, you have... T- you guys are knocking it out of the park. Wait, how often do you kill each other? And we're like, probably 1%, 2%. And they're like, that's phenomenal! Right. Like, if you put... A, if, if you had 6 billion chimps hanging out, they would all <laughs> murder each other tomorrow. <laughs> and you guys just, like, kill each other in the Middle East and Ukraine? Like, you're doing great! Yeah. I think they'd be amazed by how well we're doing. Um, one last thing. Do you think... 
religion, because I don't th- I think religion is, is irrelevant and useless. I do think it's very, very practical. I think yeah. the utility of religion, yeah. circling back to what we are saying earlier, it's very, very important. Do you think if religion was more widely adopted in our country and people had those more structured, regimented belief systems of acceptable and unacceptable behavior, we would be as happy and content as fulfilled as our predecessors who did have those things in place. Do you think it is the lack of those worldviews and belief systems and, for, you know, in other words, religion, yeah. that lack of religion that has made people just sad and uh, discontent and, and stressed assholes. out yes. and, and assholes and um, a lot of purposelessness and what purpose they are able to find. It's basically my purpose is to prove that my tiny little clique of humans is right and your tiny little clique of humans is, is bad and evil and wrong. Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree with that. As as an agnostic, I think that yeah. um, I think that I think the happiest people in the world are people that think there's an afterlife that have orgasms frequently. Yeah, I think that if you if you're if you're having orgasms regularly and you don't think that you're gonna it's blackness forever, that's the happiest place you can yeah. be. So already yeah. off to a good start, right? right. But I, I would add to that that. Um, I, I don't think America is less religious than it's ever been. I know that mm. that's the common interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think secular thinkers are vanishingly rare. They've always been a fraction of the population. Yeah. Uh, and that what's happened is all of the old um, institutional organized religions have collapsed. And rather than becoming secular, people just became political. Mm. Uh, when you talk so to— So the new religion is political ideology. Yeah, and it is a religion. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you think about—again, like again, I, I got a degree in this. Like— um, there are magical words that cannot be uttered in any context because they are an affront to the universe. Yeah. That is blasphemy. Mm-hmm. That is religious thinking. Yeah. If, if you if you if you're ta- if you're talking about the impact the words have, the yeah. propriety of it based on context or intention, now we're getting secular land. But if you're like, no, you can never like a bailiff cannot read something verbatim unless we kill him. Yeah, um, that's religious thinking. Uh, the idea that certain ideas uh, cannot be discussed because they are profane that is heresy. That's religious mm-hmm. thinking. Um, I, I, I think that um, a lot a, of the puritanical elements of the country just just went from being Puritans to being political, and that um, so and and I think it is the worst religion. Yeah, I would it would be far better to pick Star Trek or make up a new religion or something. I think politics is the because at least with religion, like when I was Eastern Orthodox, mm-hmm. I don't think our priest ever got up on a Sunday and was like, "Everybody put money in the collection plate because we got to beat those fucking Baptists. <laughs> they are the worst people in the world. We have to beat them." The whole point of our religion is to beat Baptists. So right. Some religions do that. You don't have to. Right. You can be Methodist and not hate Islam, but yeah. like, you can't really be like a full throttle Democrat without wanting to fundamentally stop the Republicans or vice versa. Like it is when you make politics your religion, it is inherently something that is built on defeating somebody else. And yeah. that breeds all this discontent. Well, and I, I think it's insidious too. Like I, I know people that a few years ago were not political at all. And then they go through this process of wanting to be informed, like what's going on in the world. And then you get, you stumble in one of these echo chambers and social media or cable news or whatever. And all of a sudden they were just foaming at the mouth, yeah. certain that the, Everything is being ruined, and, and society and culture is just being brought low because of the other side. Well, and, and, and then I, you look at the other side; it's like, well, they have all the same thoughts, just aimed in the other direction. Yeah, this the, well, literally, there's a term called Manichaean, mm. uh, and, and Manichaean is um, this was an early heresy in the church where um, uh, there was a manifestation of Christianity that probably had something to do with Gnosticism, but basically they were they were borrowing this older idea from the Persians yeah. that there's a good God and an evil God, and there's a good team and a bad team, and that's it. That's the whole thing. Yeah. And um, um, for, for a variety of reasons, that was uh, d- denounced as heresy, but uh, it's used, I think, appropriately today as a belief that politics is a battle of good and evil and there's a good team and a, not not a correct team on this particular issue right. or a basket of efficacious policy goals that you have collected but yeah. there is something fundamental and again this is a religious the, the the belief that there is a inherent essence to conservatism and an inherent essence to progressivism mm-hmm. is bullshit yeah. like like we could, like foreign policy yeah. what is conservative foreign policy because i can tell you what the republicans thought changes every 20 30 years just like it does with the democrats like yeah. when fd when when wilson went to war the republicans were isolationists and then when we get into like the 60s the republicans are the ones that want to go engage abroad and the democrats become pacifists and uh George W. Bush decides to go liberate Iraq, and it's very conservative. But then Trump decides to become an isolationist, and it's very conservative. And Biden wants to be like it literally yeah, has no I, correlation. I, I equate it to uh, sports teams. So yeah. there's people that are yeah. just like diehard 
like foaming at the mouth. This is my team till the day I die. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, which part of the team? Yeah. Is it the players? Because they're getting rotated in. They're getting traded. Is yeah. it the coach? Because, you know, they're and a the few years And the beliefs are in. changing all the time. Right. And then it's like, well, is it the mascot? Because, like, you can sell teams and they go to a different city and sometimes they keep the mascot and they don't keep the mascot. Like, what is it about this team yeah. that you are just, till the day you die, you're going to mm -hmm. bleed the color of uniform? I think that that's the best. Like, it, I, I'm, I'm increasingly saying red team and blue team rather than left and right or conservative yeah. and progressive because I think that's really what it is. Mm. And you don't have to go very far back in history. Like uh, Will William Jennings Bryan today would be considered a Bernie Sanders-esque, super left-wing populist e economic character. Also, simultaneously, the most theocratic hmm. politician in American history. So like, which was he? Was he super right-wing because he was a theocrat? Was he right. super left-wing? Because The answer is that it's all bullshit. We made yeah. it up. And, uh, um, but they, we treat them as though they're religions that have some eternal element. It's when, uh, I've traveled a lot, and it's weird talking to people where th that are really binary thinkers that are Manichaean thinkers, um, where they're like, no, 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 there's always two sides. And I'm like, I can tell you that if you go to like Saudi Arabia, and the debate is like monarchy or less monarchy. They're just having a different debate. Yeah. And we're having in what is essentially an internal fight about liberalism in the West. Mm -hmm. That is diff like a monarch or, or like, how about this? Uh, um, Hitler is super right wing and Milton Friedman's right wing. Mm. Okay, Milton Friedman was a pacifist Jew that didn't want the government to get involved in the economy. Right. Hitler was an anti-Semitic warmonger that wanted the government to run the economy. What the fuck did they agree on? <laughs> and yet right. they're both right wing and the answer is it's a bullshit system. Yeah. Um, to go back to your earlier point though, I think that religion had a very helpful role in the United States in terms of mitigating that political distinction mm. and making it secondary to, to identity. Yeah. Because um, not going back very far, um, like w when I was at the Eastern Orthodox Church, I was a Republican, but about half the parishioners were Democrat. My sense of identity was far more tied to my religion than yeah. it was my politics at that time. So I was very capable of going, okay, the deacon is a Democrat, but I know that he is you know, part of my family, and that is the most important identity to me. The political thing is secondary, and I can totally deal with them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think uh, it also had the thing of actually exposing you to people you disagreed with politically. Mm -hmm. Because if it's all the all the Catholics in your town or all the Methodists in your town, you're going to hang out with somebody that you politically disagree with, and you're going to realize that um, they're a human, and that right. this is a debate over something that is oftentimes secondary to what you truly care about. Yeah. And then as religion atrophied, I think that went away, and we started making politics the new religion. Like, when I was in college, uh, I, I dated... And entire ladies, whole ladies, <laughs> without knowing what their politics were. Yeah. But I knew what their religion was. Yeah, yeah. And now it's the other way around. Oh, where yeah. like I'll go on. I have no idea. Like I'll I'll like I'll date somebody that's Iranian or something. I I won't know if they're Muslim or Christian or what. But I'll know if they're Republican or Democrat yeah. right out the gate. Yeah. It is very important. Everybody knows. Mm. So whenever we first started this conversation, because I usually have a couple of premises, and then I float to you. We could talk about. I don't give you the exact. Would you touch it? Prompt until we get into it. I'll give you like. General, here's a topic. In general, here's another topic. I said uh, we, we have one about theology, and you perked up a little bit, and then I got into the details. And there's never been a moment in these conversations with you where I saw kind of a moment of hesitation and a lot of wheels turning. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know if I want to, but yeah. do I want to? It could be really interesting. What was that? What um, was that? What was going through your head? That thought process of, huh? Should I dive into this? The the the, the God question. I, I, I think the reality was I was thinking of personal loss for mm. me. Of of if if that door were fully closed right now, yeah. there's a crack in that door, yeah. and maybe the door will swing open at some point. And I like knowing that. Yeah. Um, if if it were, I think that that's where that came from. If if I were to go one more layer on that, I don't know the cost benefit analysis, and mm. I I think it might actually the the net total of happiness lost may not be worth it. Mm. I don't know that we're going to get. Like I said, I think the Soviet Union was super atheist and it did some pretty bad stuff. So yeah. I'm not convinced that you make everybody atheist that suddenly world peace uh, right. happens, right? But I do think there'd be a lot of people that would no longer go to church, that would be lonely. So mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to push it. Yeah, I think I would because I do think there's a God. That's interesting prompt, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. yeah Isn't yeah, that yeah. weird? You'd think that I'd be, yeah. you know, the dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job. It's my job. <laughs> Andrew Eaton, this is always fun, man. My pleasure. Yeah, we want to know, hey, would you guys push the button? Would you touch it? If you could reveal whether or mm -hmm. not God existed, let us know.